Hands in praise, praise him. Praise is who I am, and I will praise you while I can. I my hands in praise, and I got to praise you through the good and the bad. I praise you with a happy or sad. I praise you in all that I go through. Cause praise is what I do. And now I owe it all to you. So praise is what I do. Even when I'm going through, I've learned to worship you. And in my circumstance, it doesn't even stand a chance. My praise outweighs the bad.
your Christmas? Good? Good. Did you think of Mary, those that came the previous Sunday here? Think about the song that she wrote, sang back to the Lord. I'm still thinking about it. All right, we have the opportunity to go before the Lord and uh, bow our hearts during our altar prayer. What I want to do, again, since we're closing out the year, is um, to just focus on who God is. You can interject personally and privately when we're going through this, a specific request that you may have. But I want to focus on why we're worshiping him, why we're praising him, especially going into the new year next Sunday. So bow your hearts with me as we go before our mighty God and King. Holy Father, my mind still reflects on last Sunday. Thinking about your plan and your purpose. And how you chose a woman. And that woman put a song together in her heart. One now that I, I can't even remove from my mind. In the very first verse of Luke 1, 40, 46 stated that in her words my soul glorifies the Lord specifically my mind my emotions my will that's what it means my personality glorifies the Lord in her inner being and then she follows it up with the higher faculty of my spirit rejoices in God. So a person's total being, mind, emotions, and will that relate to the here and now, the thinker, the feeler, the decider, and then the spirit magnifies and glorifies you. Why? What is it about you? And we've learned 12 aspects in light of the name that you carry in the Old Testament. 12 character traits that describe, if we can actually say that, who you really are. And as we bow our hearts this morning, closing out this year, looking forward to next year, we want to focus on just four character traits that your name describes this morning. And as we do that, we can lift up silent personal prayer requests from these names that will display your power. May you give us the heartbeat that Mary had to magnify you in our inner being, inner man, the real us to lift you up. And I think of the very first name we learned, Elohim. El meaning power, might, and strength. That's why we worship you. 
And him is the plural form of the word God. So the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Mighty, strong, creator. Having the ability to take nothing and make something from it. The universe, the galaxies, everything that we see. That's the God we have a relationship with. Elohim. No other God like that. When people say different names for the same God, not you. Not the God of the Bible. Not the Trinity. No one has this power but you. And for that, we worship and lift you up this morning. And for those that may have problems that seem insurmountable, may they attach their request to this name. An almighty, an all-powerful, God of the universe that controls and creates. What a savior. And then we learned of Jehovah, a verb in the Hebrew text, meaning to be, a God that always existed, that was never created by man but always was, is, and will be. Jehovah, life eternal. Amazing. And this God can give us eternal life. To know you, the Bible says, is to have eternal life. And so we pray and worship you because you and you alone are the one that gives us life. I mean, that's Christmas. That's why Mary said, my soul rejoices. My spirit magnifies. The God of the universe, Elohim, Jehovah, who gives life. And to think, we now are a part of that. How can we worship you adequately in light of it? And the request that we may have... May we recognize that you are a God that is. That is with us. That will never leave us. Never forsake us. A God whose attribute is life and life eternal. You give us the meaning and purpose of life. And maybe this past year there are some that lowered their sights on the things of the world. And now the last Sunday of the year, they recognize an emptiness. But your word says, you are our hope. You are the purpose. You give us purpose and meaning in life. Jehovah, eternal life. And then, Father, we think of the third word that describes you, El Shaddai, an almighty, there we go again, El, power, strength, an almighty God who supplies specific, special needs. So those that are praying now, whether it be online or presently here, they may have some needs. I have some needs. 
We got an all-powerful God who part of his description is he meets those needs. That's why we worship you. That's why we lift you up. That's why we magnify you. And the biggest need of man is a reconnection to you, and that was Christmas. Giving us a Savior born to die so that we might be born to live eternally with Jehovah forever and ever and ever. Oh God, as we lift up our requests to you, El Shaddai, may you meet the needs that are being lifted up personally. And last, Lord Jesus, we think of another plural name that describes the God we worship, Adonai, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the meaning behind that word that we learned was that you own everything. You even own us, those of us that know you in a personal way. We have been bought with a price. We are not our own. That's why we lift you up. That's why we love you. What security we have when the world, and we'll see it today in the sermon, with young people being Anxious, being depressed, having no hope. Adonai says that he owns everything, even us. And if we are in your hand, and Jesus, you're in God's hand, the Father's hand, how much more secure can we be in life, no matter what trials we face? That's why we worship you today, sing to you today, love you today. That's why it's not as much verbal as it is in our inner being, the soul, the spirit. It starts from there. May it happen to all of us this morning again. Thank you. Trinity for hearing our prayer. More importantly, thank you ahead of time for answering. But in the present, in the moment today, through the singing, through the sermon, may we love and magnify you. And may it start, may we copy Mary, may it start in our soul in our spirit and overflow in our behavior this morning. And may you look down on those that are attending all of it now and those that are listening online and bless us as we intimately have fellowship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you ready for some a thinking moment or two? I got one that happened yesterday, but let me get, read two of them to you. And if you're visiting, again, the thinking moments are just us picking things that are happening in our culture and making us all steal a phrase from Arsenio Hall, make us go, hmm, how does that measure with the Bible? So, let me give you the first one. Uh, I could not really believe it, but uh, the article says brazen uh, thefts bring out Proposition 47 critics. This is in the state of California. Um, The article was last week. And basically, uh, here, let me quote to you. And then, remember, what's the purpose of government biblically? Here it is. I think it was the biggest con job in California history, says Sacramento County District Attorney uh, Anne Marie Schubert. And then she says, criminals have been laughing at us. 
there's a clear belief and a very large reality that there's no consequences anymore for theft. You tell everybody we're not going to hold anybody accountable and guess what's going to happen. And so now the big issue is how do we stop crime has increased? What's the purpose for government biblically? To make our society safe for its people. The question is, is it today? All right, got another one for you. Thinking moment, Bible principle, measure what we see. Here's one. Uh, threats, fights, anxiety, school tensions mount. Educators blame the rise on social media and COVID. Oh, I see. So it's the virus and social media that are causing the anxiety, the fights, and the threats that we've seen in schools. What do you think about that one? Nobody wants to take accountability, not even the educators. Just a thought. And the last one, I'm going to pick on the preachers. So last night, I'm surfing on the TV. I'm not going to mention his name. Because when I was in Compton, Linwood, we got some of his folks for this very reason. Um, so he's preaching out of Genesis 26. And the whole thought is about giving. And his audience is going crazy. Remember I told you that if homeboy gets in the pulpit and doesn't give you the literary, grammatical, historical approach, he's going to misinterpret it. And that approach means putting it in context, telling you who the audience is, showing you what the problems are, and then taking a principle based on the context of that scripture. So Genesis 26 deals with uh, Israel and being a blessing to the other families of the earth. Specifically, it's shifting from Esau to Isaac. And in that chapter, Isaac gets blessed. Why? Because he had faith in God. Like Abraham, the father of faith. Isaac and his group were believers and trusted God. Because of that, he blessed them. Well, homeboy... Doesn't talk about obedience, doesn't talk about any of that, doesn't talk about what went before it, what went after. And you know what he's saying? That you give. And when you give, you'll get more money back. That's not why you give. That's not the motive. If you're doing it like that, then it becomes a little magical game. Now, God says that he will, you can't outgive him. He says in Malachi, test me, but you don't give to get more money. That's not the reason. And then you better share with people that it's obedience that God blesses. So now the question is, why are these preachers doing this? And what's worse, what really hurt my heart, his audience didn't catch it. Didn't catch it. But he is the best dressed preacher I've ever seen. Anyway, thinking moment. Think about it. Look at God's word and apply it. And with that, I will turn this over to the officers as we prepare for the offering. I just want to thank you for it. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. I just want to thank you.
up, church. I didn't get enough of singing Christmas carols this, <laughs> this season. So if, if everybody will turn in your hymnals to hymn, hymn 56, this was a special request by one of our members in the church. And so
All right, you ready to go to work? Yes, All right, uh, scripture reading for this morning's text will be John 17, verse 17, and 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. And starting next Sunday, we will be going into the fourth and final segment of John 17. As we've been in it almost a year. Um, we'll be finishing out 17 through the remaining portion of the chapter. I think it's through 24, 25, something like that. All right. So I'm reading both uh, texts, and I'll be reading from the NIV version, so maybe a little bit different than what you have, but follow with me. First, John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them by the truth. This is Jesus speaking in his prayer to the Father. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Let's pray. Holy Father, again, we come to you and we thank you for the one thing that sanctifies us, your word, truth. And we thank you for providing the Holy Spirit who is the best teacher we could ever have. And so we appeal to him to illuminate this text to make it simple for me and others to understand. And then to do the thing that he's really, really good at. And that is to apply it, to counsel us. The word says he is a counselor. And so may he have his way in our hearts. The good thing about him, since he's God, he knows our hearts. And he knows exactly where we need to be ministered to, personally, individually, and at the same time, collectively as a church body. So may he have his way as we allow him and open up our hearts to minister to us. And then when we leave here, may we be like Mary and magnify you, God in our soul and in our spirit as the result of what the Holy Spirit has done in this service. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, you'll notice in the outline provided for you, there's a part three, so it means that we've had part one and two, and for two weeks we've had two special messages, the anniversary service and a Christmas service. So now we're back to where we are in John 17. So let me, if you're like me, you forget, let me review part one and part two for us. And then we'll pick up where our outline uh, that is provided for you uh, picks up. And those of you online, Wes has provided one for you. So let's review parts one and two. You don't have to take any notes, just listen. We're going to tie together verse 17 that we just read and 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Why is that verse there? And remember the big topic in chapter 17 is sanctification. What is sanctification? It means after you have accepted Christ, that the Holy Spirit sets you apart. Okay, and now it's a process of living. He sets you apart so that you and I can mature to be more holy. It doesn't happen overnight. You've been born again. It's a process, just like you and I are growing. When you're, you become a baby and now you're growing, hopefully, to maturity. So he sets us apart to be holy, to be used by him for a special purpose in a world that is not believing. That's broad picture. 1 Corinthians 15 is a resurrection chapter. 
Remember that? And I ask you as an audience, what's the topic of 1 Corinthians 15? And you rightly responded, the resurrection. Then why would Paul stick in a statement in verse 33 that says, bad company corrupts good character? If the topic is the resurrection, why are you putting in there bad company corrupts good character, so stay away from bad company? Why would you do that? And we learned the purpose of that is that the resurrection and that doctrine and that teaching has taught us that as believers, we as Christians will be judged. Not for salvation, but for how we lived. And so Paul, 1 Corinthians, that was a horrible church. Remember their behavior? They were doing stuff that you would think it doesn't belong in church. So he's concerned about how they are living, knowing that there is going to be a resurrection. And Christians are going to go before the throne. And they're going to look at their Savior face to face, and there's an issue on the table. How have they lived as believers in a world that is unbelieving? And Paul doesn't want them to be hurt or to be embarrassed for living wrongly. That's why it's in. And we've been looking at that resurrection and that topic because it fits into sanctification. So let me hit the high points of part one. Does saying that you believe in Christ make you a Christian? No, it does not. Do you got proof, preacher? I do. The demons believe in Jesus and aren't saved. You don't have saved demons. They believe in him. They know that he's real, but they're not saved. So, if that's true for demons, it's true for humans. You can say all you want, I believe in Jesus, but it doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian? That you believe and receive him into your heart. That you ask him for the forgiveness of sins because you know that inside of you, you're by nature, unlike what is taught in the educational system, you're by nature good? No, you're not. You're by nature evil and wicked. We're very selfish people. And when you accept Christ, you ask him for the forgiveness of your sins. You accept him as your Lord and Savior. The other aspect that you believe in is a literal, physical resurrection of Jesus. Why should you do that? Well, because it's eyewitness, first of all. I mean, that's a legal issue right there. And there are a lot of people in a lot of religions that think Jesus just rose spiritually. Not true. He had a body. Remember when he came back? And he's bounced in and out, and he had fish for breakfast. He had a literal, physical body. You're going to have that type of body if you're a believer. When you die, and then you are risen again in newness of life. Flesh and bones, no blood. And now, there, what you have to make sure of is you believe that he literally, physically rose. Because he did. Why is that necessary? Well, it proves a couple of things. Still review. It proves, number one, he's the son of God. It proves, number two, that the father sent him for a specific plan and a purpose, and he completed it. That's John 17, 1 through 5. Three... It demonstrates that Jesus conquered every enemy opposed to God. Four, it makes you and I sure that we have the forgiveness of sins. Why? The fact that God rose him from the dead means that he accepted the sacrifice. If he accepted the sacrifice, my sins, I can be sure of, were forgiven. That was part one. Part two. The teaching of the doctrine of the resurrection gives us a spiritual picture of you and I. Believe it or not, and we looked at it in part two, it gives you and I what we look like spiritually in Christ. And what did we say? First, we've already risen with Christ. 
since we're in Christ spiritually, we rose with Christ. Second, you are in Christ and Christ is in you. We said that. We had the scripture to prove it. Third, we're dead to sin and alive to God. Do we still sin? Yeah, we do. Why? Because we still have this fallen nature in us while we're here. But we have a new nature in us that is alive to God. You want to learn about God. You want to read the Bible. You're interested in spiritual things. Before you became saved, you weren't. I wasn't. Fifth, you died with Christ, you were buried with Christ, and you rose with Christ spiritually. Everything he went through, you went through because you're in Christ spiritually. That makes you new. In Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17. You're new. And the Greek word there says you're new of a different substance. You're not all cleaned up and look pretty. You are this substance. Now you're that substance. And it's not the same. It's different. Sixth. You will physically die. And unless Christ comes back before then. You will be buried. And then when he does come back to rule, your physical body that will be dirt will match up with your spirit that is with Christ now, and you will have a resurrected, incorruptible, brand new body just like Christ. And what does that mean? Well, the results of that means there's no condemnation in you. That's what it means. In fact, Romans 8, 1 says, therefore, now there is no condemnation in you. Does that mean you're perfect? Not yet. But you're not condemned because of sin. That means that you're finished with death. That death and the sting and the fear, not for you, it's gone. Watch the way Christians die. And unsaved people die. And you'll see it. Hebrews says, man's greatest fear is dying. That's the last enemy. The Bible says once you become a Christian and you're in Christ, that fear, that sting, that tear doesn't exist anymore. In fact, death gets you to Christ. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Your earth suit deteriorates and is gone. The spirit and soul go to be with Christ. And then when he comes back physically, your spirit and your soul match up. They're going to be put together. And you go, well, how can that be? What about the people they spread their ashes over? It doesn't make any difference. He created the universe and the galaxies. This is an easy thing for him. To have nothing and create this? Come on. Look at that and see it. And then we said, we will see him face to face, eye to eye. And then we said, you will spend eternity with him forever and ever and ever. Now, let's go to work. You have your outline. The Doctrine of the Resurrection, Part 3. In light of part one and part two, now we want to look at Roman numeral one. We only have one major principle, and this is it. Deductions from our belief in a literal, physical resurrection of Christ. We're going to deduce now. We're going to take away some things in light of believing in a physical, literal resurrection. You following me? Now we're going to look at some things in light of this truth. Under A, you should have the word deductions. So because of part one and two, we're going to infer now some things. So let's walk through it. Number one, we must have nothing to do with this condemned world. I'll explain that. Number one, the first inference in light of part one and two in believing in a literal physical resurrection is number one. 
A1, we must have nothing to do with this condemned world. Now, let me repeat this. There are three words in the Greek that have one English translation for world, and they don't mean the same thing. In the English, they'll be translated world, but in the Greek, you'll get the meaning. So let me give it to you. The first one, the first English word world that we get, we see it in the Bible, is the universe. That's not what we're talking about here. It's not the physical creation. The second Greek word that is translated world is cosmos. That means people. Remember I used the magazine Cosmopolitan? It's humanity. So in John chapter 3, it says, For God so loved the world. The Greek word is God so loved the cosmos. What is the cosmos? Humanity. And it makes sense. God so loved humanity that he gave his son. But that's not the word here. When we must not have anything to do with this world, and this is a big one, it means a secular world view. It's a way of thinking. It's a worldly way of thinking. And what one of the inferences, you and I living a resurrected life, are to have nothing to do with a secular worldly approach Two issues, and I'm going to give you some examples, okay? Just to solidify it, let me go after it. Thinking moments again, so here we go. There is no such thing as absolute truth. That's what the world says. In fact, if you take a class in higher education, they're going to tell you that. So now we're going to apply it. Jesus said, I'm the truth. That definite article, the, means he's the standard. That means God is the standard. That means his book is the standard. So if you're a young person and you want to learn how you should behave with your parents, here you go. It's here. It tells you how you should behave, how you should look at your mother and your father. If you want to look at economics, it's here. If you want to look at government and politics and politicians, it's here. If you want to look at what you should be like as a husband or a wife, it gives you the requirements. If you're a preacher and you want to know how you should be behaving and how you should be preaching, it's here. It's all here. But the world has another set of standards. And one of them is there's no such thing as truth. Okay, so Jesus said he is the truth, but the PhDs at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton say there is no such thing as truth. Now we have an issue. And so let me give you the common sense approach to this. If you don't have any absolute truth, that means no standard for, for you and I to measure anything or anybody by, you only have left your feelings to decide if it's right. And how a person feels, there are lots of feelings going on. Feelings lie sometimes. When you think you're feeling this way and it means this guy likes you and you find out you made a mistake. He smiles at everybody, ladies. And so guess what? He doesn't have any special feeling towards you. You see the problem here? This is where we're at as a culture today. You go by feelings. In fact, it's caught on so much that people even say, you feel me? Huh? You feel me? No, I don't feel you. I want to know if it's right or wrong. That's the key. Whether I feel good, if it's wrong, then that means I shouldn't do it. So, you see the difference? Let me give you another one. 
biological men competing against biological women because they feel like a woman. And our culture is saying nothing. Let me give you the illustration. University of Pennsylvania. You have a male who now feels he's transgender and he's smashing all these women's swimming records but nobody told you that for the last three years he competed as a male, but guess what the problem was? He never won a race. So now he feels female, and he's blowing these ladies out by incredible times. Okay, well, the chromosomes say truth that he's a dude sorry any way you swing it I don't care how you feel see what happens when you don't have a standard then you go by feelings and so now you open up everything so now you got a guy feeling like he's a girl and I, here's my question where are the feminists on that one Nobody's saying anything. The preachers leave it alone. I can't. There's something wrong here. And, and it needs to be exposed so that you can see biblical truth is not measuring up in our cultural society. Let me give you another one. You got wrong behavior today classified by psychology as diseases. Wow. So that means that the, the accountability is, uh, it's a disease. We can talk about this, but let me throw this thought out. What disease do you know that you can use talk therapy in to cure it? See? See how man... And it just shows man's heart. He doesn't want God's standard. He wants to invent what works for him. And it, that shows the heart and the issue. But the biggest reason you have in your outline, as an example, small a, 1 Corinthians 15, 24. 1 Corinthians 15 Verse 24, this is the biggest reason you and I are not to fall prey to popular worldly thinking. And here it is, 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God. This is uh, Christ, to God the Father. After he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. And... Who controls this world system of thinking? We've learned it. Satan. So you have a secular thinking today that goes out and it's run by, behind the scenes, by the enemy. And he doesn't use dumb people. These guys from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton are smart, but they're blinded. And so they attach on, and now they teach our kids. And this is why our kids go away to college. And I have two girls that are about ready to do it. They go out, and then they come back, and they want to debate everything that is biblical. I'm already getting it. I gave one of my daughters, well, I, both of them, I can share this. I gave them the book we talked about, the lady that came from Jamaica, that went to college on her own with no government help. This is in the 50s and 60s. Raised three kids on her own. Graduated from college, then decided to go to law school. Went to law school, then became an attorney and had her practice, and now she is the lieutenant governor of Virginia. She just won. And the majority of the black community and the white liberals are hammering her. And I forgot to tell you, she's a devout Christian. 
See, the world looking at the truth and not liking it. And so let me define worldliness for you. This is not in your notes, but I would write it down. F put this down, 1 John 2, 15 and 16, because this is going to describe the world and its thinking, okay? And it's nice and neat, and it's something that's easy to remember, okay? I'm going to read it for you, 1 John chapter 2. Verses 15 and 16, NIV version, but I memorized it from the King James. Um, so it's three things, but let me read it for you first. Do not love the world. Okay, that's a statement now. That's not a don't do it if you don't feel like it. It's a command. Do not love the world. It's the thinking now, not the universe, the physical creation. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. So the easy way to remember it is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's a description of loving the world. Now, take a look at the people we admire, the ball players, the movie stars, the politicians, and look at their lives if they're not believers. And you see the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the reason why he tells us not to love it, all that's going to be destroyed. That's all going to be destroyed. So why would you have an interest in it? That's the key. That's what he's sharing with you and I. What confuses me is when you and I see people who call themselves Christian and attach a lot of significance to lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. They want position. They want power. They want pomp. They want to be noticed. That confuses me. Things that belong to that realm are condemned. They won't last. That's the first deduction. That's why we don't love them. The world and its thinking. And if you get to a mode, it's sort of fun to catch people thinking like that. Especially when you're watching TV or you're listening to people think, and even preachers, you should be testing them. You should know the word well enough that you can tell in the first three minutes whether or not he knows what he's talking about by how he lays out the text. He better be telling you about the history, better be telling you about the audience, better be telling you about the grammar and the words and the definitions, better be telling you the principle and the topic, and I'll use a word from a rapper. Context, 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 context. He better be putting it into context or you just got hot air in somebody's opinion. And you don't pay for that. You pay for what is it saying. The guy I used in the thinking moment never once took his audience to this to let the audience read and see if what he's saying was true. He might as well. He didn't need this. Was he charismatic? Yep. Did he look pretty? Yep. Did he dress nice? Yep. Did he make him laugh? Yep. But he said wrong stuff. That was the problem. Okay, so let's look at Paul's assessment. Of this. I'm still, it's an illustration. We'll get to the next point. You with me? I haven't lost you, have I? All right. Acts 20, 24. Acts 20. I want you to, I want you to see Paul's version of his, and his estimation of this. So you can jot it down somewhere on your outline. Acts 20, uh, verse 24. This is what he says. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race 
complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. In other words, here's what he's saying. None of this stuff in the world moves me at all. That's what he's saying in that verse. Let me share this thought. Men and women who move the world are ones who do not let the world move them. You want that one again? Men and women who move the world are ones who do not let the world move them. My two young daughters like to be rebels. They're believers. Now, we were all in that when we were teenagers, right? So here's what I told them. You really want to be a rebel? You want to buck the system? You want to go against the grain? You want to stand out? Because that's what it sounds like. You're taking what the world is saying and you think, you think you're going against the grain? No, you're with the grain. They all think like that. The teachers teach you to think like that. You want to be a thinker? Buck the grain? Go against the system? Be rogue? Be a rebel? Be gangster? You want to do it? Start talking this. And we'll see in your classroom what your friends say. We'll see if you're the target by the teacher. Be smart now, because they're coming. So know the truth. So then when the teacher comes, you don't have to say the Bible, I'm a Christian. Just pull the principle out. Let them know, hey, teach, if you don't have absolute truth, then the only thing you can measure anything on is feelings. Is that correct? And they're going to have to say, yeah. Well, then we have 30 people in the classroom, 30 different feelings. How do we ever figure it out who's right? Now you buck the grain. Now you go against the norm. What about you? Where are you at? I think today we have too many undercover Christians. From the pulpit on down, anybody can preach to a group that agrees with you. But now when it gets out there and they listen to what you're saying, it's going to rub people the wrong way. Even Christians. Look what happened to Paul. He had them inside the house, outside the house. Everywhere the poor brother went, they were after him. Save folks, unsaved folks. Now, what about you? Where would you measure up? What do you think going into this next year? All right. Thank you for those amens. Let's go to letter B. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Second proof text. Let's look at it. 15, 20. All right. And let's see what this says. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Paul's telling these Corinthians now. This is a fact, he's saying. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You know what this means? This means that the next chapter in human history is God's kingdom's going to come. One thing I always get hit with, and I, I've had it when I, when I lectured at a couple of universities, uh, They'd say, well, you know what? We don't, God doesn't speak. What are you talking about? Wait, we, we, you know, we don't hear anything from him. What do you need to hear? He, he's spoken through his word, but let's forget that. Let's just look at history. He came, he died, he rose. We have eyewitness. You have Josephus, a Jew who wasn't a believer. He wrote about it. I said, so now, now what do you mean he doesn't speak? He spoke. The next move is when he comes back and sets his kingdom up. A.D. 33, there was a resurrection. And in that resurrection, God is saying, next time I come, we're setting up my kingdom. So he spoke. What do you have to say about that? 
Nothing. Okay. Number two, let's keep going. The next deduction, our business and our duty is to always keep our eyes on the eternal. Now, that's hard to do because we live in a physical realm. Let me repeat it again. Our business and our duty is to keep our eyes on the eternal. In other words, you have one step in the physical realm, but you have another step in the spiritual realm. You and I as believers should focus on that eternal, even though we're dealing with the physical here. Half of our problems, whether we're young people, teenagers, Old people, doesn't make any difference. Half of our problems are due to the fact that we fail to do this. What do we focus on? Think about it. We always are looking at our problems. Think about that. We always look at our problems or our particular sin that we're battling with. This is the thing that gets us down today. And we must keep our eyes on the eternal. In other words, we must see big picture, not get caught up, not being able to see the forest from the trees. Think about it. If you're a young person, what do you focus on? I bet you, you focus on the issues that affect you, the trials, the situations, the problems. Very little is thinking on the eternal. That's why you get stressed. That's why you unravel. That's why you have anxiety. And the Bible tells us you got to have the balance here. you got to be looking to what is real. Let's take a look. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. You see that under small a? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians, NIV version, chapter 4, 17 and 18. And here's what it states. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. There's your key approach to battling with the issues of life. Now, I wonder how many of us actually practice that. You have to remind yourself about some things. You got to remind yourself of the truths that we've been learning spiritually. If you focus on what is seen, then you're going to unravel, get discouraged, get depressed, be anxious. But if you focus on the bigger picture, focus on what is not seen, that's what he's telling us. So here's the question we should ask. How consistent are we in that? That's going to determine exactly our state of mind and how we're feeling about things. How do you face a particular sin? How do you face particular problems? Put it in light of what we're learning of the eternal. You don't need a therapist to do this. By the way, you know what the therapist will have you focus on? Your problem. That's exactly the problem. Now, if you have a particular, you've heard me say, let's practice it. If I tell you right now, I'm the therapist, you're the client, and I tell you, do not think of a pink elephant. That's exactly what you're going to, now just plug in your own sin. That's what you're going to think on. That's what you're going to focus on. That's what's going to dominate you. And because it is a problem, you will not overcome it that way. You're going to feel stuck. Let me give you a real one. Well, no, let's say you're a young teenage girl. Now, this is stuff that I'm using from my daughter. So, uh, well, nobody likes me. No guys ask me out. Oh, well, okay, good. I like it. And, and, and now, the, oh, but dad, you don't, listen, 
There could be any number of reasons why guys don't ask you out. They may be intimidated on how pretty you look. Have you ever thought of that? You're talking to a guy. There were girls that I would have loved to ask out, but I thought, oh, I don't have a chance. They may be because you're too smart. They may be because you're heads up on the game that's going on. Because you know they're not going to marry you in high school. There may be any number of things. You focus on the big picture. And then you tell God what you're interested in later. And he will deliver. But the world says otherwise. Andonia, Athena. So. Be a thinker. They hate, and you know, now, Dad, you say it over and over and over. Be a thinker. Yeah, I said, you know why? Because we don't think in our society. We're taught to memorize in education, but we're not taught to think, to take truth and apply it. And now we let an elite group lead us because of it. All right, I'm getting off on a rabbit trail. So did I read letter B? 2 Corinthians, oh, okay, here's a nugget for you. Small b, 2 Corinthians 4, 17, I want to, I just read it, but I want to, I want to give you four, you have a little number one, right? It says, present troubles in a fourfold aspect. I'm taking what we read about Paul. Paul said, my, you know, these trials, these tribulations are brief, they're not, they're light, they're not heavy. So let's go through them, all right? I'm going to give you a fourfold thing. You ready? All right. This is worth money right here. No therapy. Just check this out. Thinking long, thinking spiritual. Under A, first, as to their nature, 2 Corinthians 4.17 is where I'm taking it from, okay? As to their nature, to the troubles nature, they are afflictions or trials. That's what he says. Second Corinthians. Do I need to read it? 417. Do I need to read it for you all? For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outreach and or far outweighs them all. So let's pull it apart. First, their nature, their trials. Guess what? Jesus said it. In this world, you're going to have trials. Actually, the Greek word is pressures. You're going to have pressures in life. That's common. Don't get shocked. Okay? Everybody has them. Even teenagers. Everybody. All right? You with me? All right. The afflictions, but watch this one. The trials or the afflictions that befall Christians have supernatural significance. In other words, if you're going through a trial right now, it's not accidental. God has allowed it. Why? I thought if you're a Christian, then everything goes right. You have no more. No, that's not the way it works. You have trials. But if you're a Christian, they're divinely permitted with a purpose. So now I want you to think of what are you going through? As a believer right now, it's not accidental. There's a divine purpose for you, and God has allowed it. And he overrules, being the eternal God, he overrules the trial and makes it a benefit for you. Can you prove it, Pastor? I can. You can jot this verse down. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. That word all includes bad things. Bad things work for your good. Trials will work for your good. View, if you view your troubles in that sense, you can handle them. You don't unravel. If you know that God has allowed it, he's working it for your benefit, you don't even have to understand why. You will as you work through it, and he walks with you. He gives you the trial to develop you. You know what else it makes you? 
makes you strong, not weak. It allows you to live life and not unravel. You can never do that unless you get in the mix. You can never, you know, be strong unless you get in the fight. And God knows what he's doing. He's smarter than you and me. And what if you're a Christian? What would you do? If you were God and you had a bunch of Christians that weren't really committed to you, you'd get their attention. That's what I would do. You know how you do it? Give them a trial. And then guess what they do? As soon as they have a trial, they haven't been to church in 20 years. Now they open up the door and they go to church. I need some help. They pick up the Bible. They start reading it. Then they say, God, help me. Oh, that's called praying. And before you know it, they're doing what they left. The trial worked. That's just a minor, obvious thing. All right, letter B. Second thing. As to their weight, that's the first blank, as to their weight, Paul calls the affliction light. He says it in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. He said they're light. The trials are light. Whoa, well, wait a second, Paul. Light? What are you talking about? I'm going through something and it's pretty heavy. Why are you calling it light? Let's take a look at Paul's trials. Can I do this for you? This is not in your outline. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. This is amazing. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 28. 23 through 28. I just want to read this to you. And then you tell me if any of your trials have at least measured up to him. Because he's the one that said they're light. All right. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I've received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I've been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. How about them apples? And we say we got trials. And he says those are light. Now, how can he say that? Is he nuts? Their light compared to the reward, eternity. That's what he's saying. He's measuring up. I'm going through this, but what I'm going to get is this. So they're not a burden. They're light in comparison to where I'm headed, what's for me, where I'm going to be forever. So think about it. Sickness, infirmity, blindness, deafness, obstacles, bereavement, business loss, domestic issues, anxieties, disappointments, loneliness, fears, temptations, light in light of the glory that's waiting for you. Is that the way you see your troubles? You should. That's the biblical way that will allow you to move through those troubles. And when God feels the thing is done for you, you'll be through them and finished. Let us see the third aspect as to their duration. Paul says they're but a moment. Same verse, same scripture. Second Corinthians. 417. He says their duration, their length of time is a moment. 
Now, I could hear you and I. I said it when I read it. Come on, I've been in this thing for like a long time. But perhaps, you know what I thought of? Perhaps we suffer from the length more than the strength of the burden. Have you ever thought about that? Perhaps we just want it over with. It's not that we can't bear it. It's just that it keeps going on. But then if that's the case, you and I should be thinking, what is God doing? Why is he doing this? There's a reason that he's allowed it. So why am I in it? And now God, okay, I'm in it. Now help me learn what I need to learn because of it. In comparison to eternity, it's not long. Watch this. How long are you all going to live? 80 years? Let's say 100. I'll be dead before then, but let's say 100. Here's 100 years. This block. Here's eternity. See the duration? It's not much. 100. Big difference. Big difference. So, where am I? All right, all right. So now, for you and I, if you're going through something, you need to look at it biblically. Examine yourself. Purify yourself through it, which it'll happen naturally. That sanctification that we've been talking about. And it will develop you in an area that you need it. That the Holy Spirit, the counselor, knows your heart, knows what you need most. Third deduction, never be discouraged. Never be discouraged. We must never be discouraged. Why is that? Matthew 28, 18, we're almost done. Matthew 28, 18. I know that's the hot item today. Everybody's depressed. Everybody's discouraged. But we should not be. And let me, let me share why. 28, 18. Here's what it states. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All power. All authority has been given to him. So... And you are in him, and he gives it to you. You have the strength to stay up under it. Now, if you run from the trial, let me suggest what's going to happen. Because God loves you so much, it's going to come back. It will come back more severe for the more learning. It's the very same thing we do as parents. That if your child doesn't get it, then we don't say, oh, it's okay, pull you out. You let them go again. You let them go again until they learn the objective lesson. Then you say, okay, let's go. Now, can I, get, can I give you an example? Children of Israel. They had the promised land, seven miles. Seven miles to get in. You know how long it took them? Yeah, years. You know why? Because they went around the mountain. And God said, you get it? No, we don't. Take another lap, baby. Let's go. Ready? No. Another lap. Let's go. Ready? No. Another lap. 20 years to go seven miles. They could have done it the first year. But they didn't learn the lesson. And the ones that entered were the ones that were right. All the other knuckleheads died off. So, if you're in a trial, pay attention. Don't run. Don't get stubborn. Say, God, boy, teach me. Teach me so I can learn from this and move on and I can get the heck out of it. All right. Uh, Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. Almost done. You've been really patient with me. I know there's a lot here. 
That's B. D? Oh, boy. See, now where can you go to do that? All right, fourth. You're right. You have it in your outline. Thank you, Deacon Alford. Fourth, as their utility, Paul says, they work for us. What's the purpose of the trial? As their utility, they work for us. I already gave you enough illustrations on it. Thank you. Now we're at B. Ephesians 1. Thank you. Ephesians chapter 1. NIV version again. Ephesians 1, and we're going to be looking at 19 and 20. Now watch this. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. Here it is. And it, this is exactly what we have as a, as a believer. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength. So that's why you don't get discouraged. You have that. Utilize it. He'll sustain you in the trial. And as a result, you'll keep your mind on the unseen, the eternal, not what you see. Make sense? C, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Okay, here we go again. Resurrection chapter, verse 58, towards the end. And here's what he says. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It cannot be because the trial, Paul's saying, stand firm. It's not the trial that makes you do it. It's the power in you that allows you to do it. And it's what Christ says and what he thinks that's most important. So, I'll say it again. If you're going through something, He's teaching you something. What is it? Don't run. You've got a supernatural strength and power that will allow you to sustain yourself as he teaches you through it. Number four, and we're out. No, I got four and five, and we're done. Number four, the fourth deduction. The world cannot separate me. The world cannot separate me from him and from his love. Give it to you again. The world cannot separate me. That's the first two blanks. Second two, from him, and then the last three, and from his love. Romans 8.39. 8.39. I love this verse. Chapter 8, verse 39, it says, Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 39. So here's what that means. If you're going through something, God really loves you. And he's giving you the best. And he's allowing it to work in you. I think I told you that uh, my younger daughter is a national champion in skating. And she made a big decision to switch coaches. She wanted to do it last February. And we talked, and I said, Athena, finish. But, Dad, finish. After the season, do what you want. I know it's been difficult. But if you quit, in the middle of the season, the next trial in life, you'll quit again. It'll be the easy way out. Finish and let God lead you. Thank God she, she did, and she's the better for it. And you know what? I was happy. I didn't like it, but I wanted her to stay in the trial. Last one, and we're going home. If all of this is true, all of what? Verses 1 through 4. If all of this that we just talked about is true, then I have no time, no time to lose or to spare. 
I will have no time to lose or spare. You and I are going to see him face to face. Keep in mind, we're going to die. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. We're going to see him face to face. Time goes by quick. Better start preparing for that time. 1 John 3.3. 3. I won't read it. Just jot it down. You can look at it later. The reminder that I want you to focus on is not what you see, not the trials, what you don't see. And let me give you this verse and we're done. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Listen to this. Here's Paul's method. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Let's pray. Father, a lot here today. But very practical. We have a tendency in life, I do, as a human, to focus on my problems and not to think biblically. And in a, in a broad summary, the first thing every believer must do in light of this doctrine of the resurrection is to ask you, okay, what's up, God? What are you working on? What do I need to be aware of? Show me in this process of this trial. And then to look at the unseen and say, this is preparation. You're developing me to be better as a person, to live a more holy life. So when I see Christ, I'm not going to be embarrassed. I'm going to be able to say, man, I pushed through this. There were, there were grinding moments. But Lord, I love you and I made corrections through the trials you allowed to come my way. You know, I just feel led to do this. If you're here today and you're going through a trial, maybe it's been years, and you just say, you know what, Pastor Ananias, would you just pray for me? Just right now, just stick it up and put it right back down. Don't need it to stay up. Yup. Anybody else? Yup. Yup. Anybody else? Father, those that raise their hands. I see the hands, but more importantly, you see the heart. First of all, I want to lift them up as individuals that love you. We just learned that nothing can separate us from your love. The first thing they, they need to know is that you really, really love them. And it's not a love of feeling, it's a love of action. You've proven it by what you did for them on the cross. And now I pray that they attack this issue biblically that thinking moment now taking a biblical principle which is don't focus on what we see but focus on what is unseen and what is unseen is the eternal glory that they're gonna have the face-to-face -face meeting with their Savior the privilege to spend eternity with the Trinity. That means on and on and on. Remind them of what Paul said, that these trials are not heavy in light of the future. Not a burden in light of you taking them and making it benefit them. And not 
a discouragement because you're going to develop their depth of holiness and character because of it. Every time they go to focus on this circumstance, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would prick their heart, bring them back to 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, and the truth, and sustain them through the trial. Let them learn what they need to learn. And Holy Spirit, let them see exactly what it is. That when they're done with it, they're going to say, man, God worked something here in my life. This was a very weak area, and he's developed it. He's made it better. And I am the better for it. My character has depth. The very thing that Martin Luther King said, that a man should be measured by his character. And you're developing it for them. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for literally, physically rising Jesus. Thank you that because of you being the first fruits, the same's going to happen to every other believer. So that in light of that, we can all stand firm. We can let nothing move us. No pressure, no obstacle, no temptation, no trial. All we got to do is what Paul said. Give our life and focus to you. Thank you for making it really, really simple. Holy Spirit, and thank you for letting us see illustrations in the world that are not measuring up because their worldview, their way of thinking is skewed, is wrong. Help us to be more biblical now, marching into 2022. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Next Sunday, the new section. And I'm going to ask David, if you don't mind standing, that he will take us home in the benediction with a song. you. Have a great week and greet somebody you don't know on your way out. Watch meeting, yes. Uh, when is it? 10.30? 10.30 right here, seeing in the new year. Is it
Friday? Oh. Yeah. God bless you all. <laughs>